Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today we're going to be talking about five things that were shocking that Jesus said. That's right. So many people have the conception of Jesus as a hippie, itinerant preacher who just went with the flow. But the truth about Christ and his sayings is much deeper. You want some shock value? Prepare to be shocked. All right, welcome back for, to another episode. Uh, this is definitely a shocking topic. I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is just shocking. No, but I, I mean, I, I, uh, when, when discussing the show notes with you guys, yeah, there, there are definitely some things that one could point to uh, of what Jesus said that seems a, a little, a little awkward or uh, off centered. So I'm excited to do this episode with you guys. No, it's true. I mean, when you're reading the scriptures, you know, you do, you are confronted with things and it's like, whoa, what, what was meant by that? And it, it inquires like, and it really draws you in, like, let's look more deeply into what actually is being said. And when you apply those types of teachings, it could change the trajectory of your life and your perspective forever. Yeah. This episode's maybe a call for you to go back and read, read the, the gospels again, if it's been a while. You know, so often we live in a we live in a soundbud culture where it's one little verse on an image and it's on your Instagram and it's it's so nice and gentle and it's like don't worry everything is the flower of the fields but there's more to it and there's a totality of the gospels that you need to read them together and not just take out little pleasing parts you can't just have dessert you also have to have your vegetables too right and that's mm-hmm. what we're gonna try to get into today is some of these things that I think people don't really consider that often because they're they're not easy teachings they're not easy sayings of jesus you know for every my yoke is light and my burden is easy there's something that jesus said that's very challenging and a direct you know that's calling you out that you feel personally accused and that's what we want to get into today now before we get into the episode real briefly father rich why don't you tell everyone how they can follow us and uh, learn more about us I'd be happy to. So make sure you hit up www.catholictalkshow.com. There you'll see all of our show notes, all of our shows, and most especially every way that you could listen in or view our content. We're on all of the audio. Yeah, I'm sorry. Podcast services. Coming Podcast in services. <laughs> That's right. Sorry. Yeah, yeah so we're okay. on all of the audio podcast services from Spotify to iTunes and everything in between. We're on YouTube. And if you are watching our content on YouTube, make sure you click the subscribe button, click the little bell next to it. So every time we produce a video, it will populate in your feed and you won't miss any content. Now, we wouldn't be able to get started without giving a shout out to our patrons, those who support us financially. We wouldn't be able to do the show without you. So if you are considering to become a financial supporter of the show, go to patreon.com forward slash Catholic talk show, and you'll see every way that you could support us. And we've got some cool content for you, including some of the most incredible hoodies in the world, Catholic talk show logo, make sure you get one and be prepared for the colder days that may come. Now, Father Rich, you know, I know that you had a pretty dramatic conversion. You know, you were somewhat of a resolute teen. We all were, we were all total scumbags and that's okay. Uh, that's why we all get along so well, it because is. it's like that. It's that sense of Jesus's mercy that transformed us. That, you know, when we when we are sharing testimony, we share it in just such a light of love for Christ because of what he has done in our lives and how he's how he's directed us from that resolute teenage adolescent foolishness. Right. So when you were going through your conversion, I'm sure the things that immediately appealed to you and the things that immediately made a change were like these positive things. But, you know, as you got deeper and you started discerning the priesthood and you went to seminary, I, I know you did a ton of studying. I know how much, you know, learning you did. Um, and you're starting to unpack these harder sayings, you know, what's kind of the perspective of of learning those things? And, um, and then, you know, how did that change inform you in your understanding of scripture? One of the things that that I've taken home throughout my biblical studies from undergrad to graduate studies was from a scripture scholar and Father Basso. And Father Boss was a priest of uh, Pensacola, Tallahassee, the northwest part of Florida. He's actually got a preaching assignment at uh, at the University of Notre Dame this year. He's he's just such a gifted man. I know Ryan Delacrosse remembers him very, very well. He, He expressed, you know, 
the problem of eisegesis is exactly what Sheil was saying before. It's like we can kind of pull out like these little verses and we don't get the larger context. It's important when we're reading scripture to look at it within the chapter context, to look at it within the within the whole gospel. So if, if you're pulling from Matthew, it, not just to pull verses that, that may like appeal to you, that's an important thing devotionally to do. But at the same time, you need to be able to look at that verse in the context of the larger picture. And that larger picture is being delivered to particular communities in the different gospels. And for me, the take home was, you know, don't really come to some form of conclusion on a scriptural inspiration. Allow it to continue to breathe in you spiritually and mm -hmm. continue to explore the very depths of what is being expressed by Christ, especially when he is speaking and when he is, you know, he is the word incarnate, when the word is in action in the world, you know, look at the larger historical context, look at the cultural context, look at who this gospel is being directed to, and look within the larger scope of that chapter of what Jesus is actually saying. And something that helps too is cross-referencing, that there may be a synoptic element to this, where in Matthew, Mark, or Luke, it's, it's being expressed with a little bit of a variation so that it can really illuminate what, what's actually being said. All right. Well, thank you for that, because I think that's important to note before we get into this list of five things, because understanding these things as we're talking about them and understanding the need to look at them within context and then use this as a call to further explore the Gospels is important. So number one on the list is something that probably too many people do anyway, but not because Jesus tells them to, but because they're bad children. And that's Jesus says to hate your parents. Now, we all know the commandments, honor thy mother and father. But here we have Jesus in Luke 14 saying, hey, if anyone comes to me without hating his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even his home life, he cannot be my disciple. That does not sound like a, a sweet, hippie, itinerant preacher. I mean, he's telling you, if unless you hate your family and your kids and your mom and your wife, you know, you're not worthy of me. That's that's pretty hard for a lot of people to, uh, to, to hear, right? It's either you love your parents or and your children. It's like, how can I hate my children and be a good Christian? How can I follow Christ by hating my wife? That doesn't make sense. What are your guys' thoughts on that? You know, Delacross, I want to hear what you have to say, but like the the first thing that comes to mind is I literally just had this conversation with like a 15-year-old kid and her mother um, when I just flew into Orlando heading back from the men's expedition. And it was exactly that. The 15-year-old daughter was like, I just, I don't understand. And, and they don't practice their faith. They were not raised with faith, but she knew this teaching of Jesus and she's like, I don't understand, like, why I would hate my mother. And the mother was sitting right there, and the mother's like, yeah, I don't want you to hate me, you know, kind of, kind of a thing. But Delacross, what, what are your initial, initial thoughts? Well, I, my initial thought was, <clears throat> you got to go to the Hebrew, right? I mean, like, <laughs> that, isn't that what we do? We go back to the original text and, then, and, and, and try to derive meaning because – the, 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 and we'll talk about this later in the show, but the Hebrew language is very, very beautiful. <clears throat> Even the structures by which they, they write um, are, are very beautiful and very meaningful. So I wanted to look at that because I'm like, okay, hate. Well, in, in Hebrew, this meaning is the, the equivalent is to love less. So like you're not forced into some strict, uncompromising, literal usage of detest, right? So again, in, in our language, we, we are unable to show to love less is not a word anymore. It's not, it's not a word that you can exercise in like Hebrew, but that's what it means. And I, and I think about, you know, I think about when I went to the seminary and my father, God rest his soul said, you know, you don't have to do that. I said, yeah, I don't have to do it, but I want to, and you're not going to stop me if that's where you're going with this. Now, I hate you, Dad. I'm going to be a priest. Yeah. yeah. Does that mean I hate you? Heck, no, man. My, I love my dad. But, but you know, when when I was in that moment, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. I, 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 that, that, that came to life. And 
you know, I just told my father like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I need your blessing. You know, I don't, I don't want any like, you know, prop. We got some problems. We don't, we don't want no problems. Here, <laughs> so, but, but Jesus is right. If, if the, and I'm not a scripture scholar, but if, if that's what that word means, um, yeah, he's right. You have to love them less. Jesus is the, is the, fo- should be the focus of our lives. And naturally, supernaturally, we're given this love for him but at the same time it's way more way more fruitful i think to love you know god than it is to love my parents over god right you know you you father rich you mentioned something about you know some not verses and if you look at matthew 10 37 to 39 is that that's what you're gonna perfect, say yeah that's the perfect that's the perfect thing well, i yield the floor to you yeah well no i mean like and and that's it's it's expressing exactly what delacross is saying in the root words and the and the conceptual cultural understanding of what hatred is coming from Judaism, Jesus is a Jew, so he's going to be thinking in these cultural terms. He's going to be expressing himself in these cultural terms. Now we know that the New Testament is written in Greek, but it's so good that Delacross is sharing the Hebrew of it because it's showing the mind of Jesus and how Jesus is expressing this. Now in the he would gospel, have spoken in Aramaic. He would have spoken in Aramaic, but, but thought you know, in Hebrew. As, Yeah, and he would have taught in Hebrew. So it's important to realize that, you know, there are ancient languages associated here, and we should explore them all, right? We should explore them all so we get a full picture. Instead of coming to a conclusion without any study, it's like, well, Jesus says to hate my mother. I'm not going to hate my mother. Therefore, I don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. Right. Or I don't want to look at the scriptures, and I I don't want to look more deeply into it. No, like this is... What, yeah, what were you're you talking saying? about perseverance, like spiritual perseverance, right? Like we're, we're, we're often, um, you know, especially in this day and age where everything's like in a soundbite, like you were talking about, yeah. Yeah. it's like you get one little soundbite. It's, it's like the seed being sown in rock, right? You need, mm-hmm. you need to give soil. Part of being, p- part of having good soil is to have perseverance in your spiritual life, to not give up when you're questioning something but to persevere through it because there, there's, there's grace involved in that. Right. Mm-hmm. I think that's absolutely people- true. Like if you're lowering a bucket into a well and it's just, you lower it down a few inches and you didn't fill up water. It's like, you're just going to stop there. Or are you going to go deeper? And yeah. you know, like you want to explore the depth of a well's potential to provide the satiating waters from its depths until yeah. it's exhausted and then, then move on. But, mm-hmm. you know, let's look more deeply in it. And I'm so glad that Sheila's teed this up for cross-referencing synoptic gospels because Matthew has something to say. Matthew 10, 37. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. So it ties perfectly to what Delacross is saying in, in the Hebrew. It's tying ex- expressively like, what, is, what does hatred mean, love less? And what I, what I love as well is that the next verse in the 10th chapter of Matthew expresses, and he who does not take his cross up and follow me is not worthy of me. And, and what is the greatest cross that we have? Is, is the labor of love within the human family. And the human family does not have the potentials to fill the deepest recesses of our soul and heart and give us peace and and love and uphold us in existence itself like God's creative hand does all of that. God's creative redemption in the person of Jesus Christ actively redeeming us. So the preference of love, it's a no-brainer. Of course, I am going to love my God, the creator of the universe, who's choreographing not only my own familial love, now he's calling me to a greater love that's expressive in the church, that that now my love of just self and those who are immediately uh, attached to me, now my love grows outside of that. And, and that can only be accomplished in God and in Christ. You know, our culture nowadays says, you know, love is love. Whatever you want to do is fine as long as you're not hurting someone. Yeah. And it's a very superficial concept of the fulfillment and the totality of what love can be. Mm-hmm. And, and Christ is right here. You cannot, if you love your children or your wife or your parents or yourself more than him, it's an incomplete love. It doesn't mean that there's not true love there, but to get the fulfillment and the depth of what love really can be, it has to ultimately be seen through 
the creative and redemptive work of the Trinity. You cannot love your child as much as if you love Jesus more. And through that, that pass through a perfection, then pass that to your children. You actually ultimately end up loving your children more if you love Jesus more first, it, you know, yeah. and it's kind of like a, 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 um, like a circuit, right? You know, electricity. Once it, you know, if you, if you break it at one place, there's a minimum load that's coming through. But if you let it pass through some amplifiers, man, it, it gets even more intense. And, and that's what he's saying here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. and Shield, like relativism is the most perfect affront to what Jesus is doing. Right. You know, Jesus is breaking down barriers and uniting. Relativism keeps us in compartmentalized little senses of false senses of of safety and and a false sense of love like relativism defeats what christ is trying to accomplish in establishing union of all nations and all mm -hmm. peoples now that's yeah. a good segue because our numbers our second one on our list of shocking things that jesus said is it comes from um matthew 10 and he says do not think that I have come to bring peace upon the earth. I have come to bring not peace, but the sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's enemies will be of his own household. Mm -hmm. Jesus is a cause of division. Now, everything you hear today is unity. We need to be more together. We need unity. Jesus saying no. No, we don't need unity in for unity's sake. We need unity through Christ's sake, through the cross. That's the only unity that matters because every other unity is superficial. But I have not come to bring, bring peace but the sword. That does not sound like the gentle, lamb-carrying, Kenny Loggins-looking guy you see on every prayer card, right? Yeah, this but is, it, this is intense. It, it also contradicts when Peter you know, chopped off that guard's ear, right? In the garden of Gethsemane too. So, I mean, you've mm -hmm. got, well, I guess he said, no, don't bring the sword. Right. He's, he's like, well, he said, so if you there's live a by lot the sword, of inconsistencies you die by the sword. there. Right. Yeah. And I don't say they're inconsistencies, you know, there, there's, you know, metaphors and analogies mm -hmm. and all yep. kinds of literary devices. But I think the core of what he's saying here is look, the, the result of my preaching and following me is that you are not going to be loved by the world and you are going to be setting yourself apart intentionally for something better. And that sword is going to break families. Look, Father Rich, I mean, in your family, does everyone agree with you being a priest? I mean, has that caused <laughs> division in your family? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I still remember, you know, my buddy's father, Josh Swallows and, and Father Tim Holita, good friends with uh, Delacross and I. And, you know, we're on the shores of a, of a lake fishing or they were on the shores of lake fishing. And my dad came up and he threw a line out in the water. And and my buddy Josh, who's like just such matter of fact, like direct type of a guy, he's like, so what do you think about your son, you know, becoming a priest and giving his whole life, you know, to Christ and, and being celibate and all that? And my dad's like, well, you know, he still he still has a year to, you know, to figure this out, I think he he should have the joy of having children and he should have the joy of, you know, and, and it was like on the eve of my diaconate ordination, which is like for, for priests becoming priests, the transitional diaconate happens a year before, but you make the vow of celibacy as a transitional deacon. And Josh turns to him and he's like, uh, you realize he's making that promise tomorrow. Like he's, he's kind of entering into this thing tomorrow. And, you know, like all throughout, all throughout my experience of, you know, living out what I felt called by Christ to do that was affirmed by the church and affirmed by my spiritual directors and clearly something that I, I willingly want to respond to with, with every amount of passion and zeal that's in me. It was, it was affronted by so many different uh, family members and one in particular, you know, a family member expressed to me initially, and this is before I discerned priesthood, but my whole life changed when I encountered the real love of Christ and the power of the spirit. And I started going to church every day. My behavior stopped. I stopped leave, living like a heathen. And the person said to me, you know, Richie, I don't even know who you are anymore. That's it. You know, I don't even, I don't even want to spend time with you. And yeah. And like, that was, that was painful. Yeah, you know, that was, that was a very painful place. And, and I went immediately into the chapel and I prayed 
and I brought the diary of St. Faustina with me. And um, as I was praying, I just heard, I heard the words like, Richard, love her. Don't preach to her. Don't expect anything, but just love. And that's what I've done from then on. And, and, you know, like I have no expectations, but to your point, like that experience of the sword with, without a doubt, without a doubt. And I, I remember expressing like, you know, if, if Jesus is calling me to uh, renounce father, mother, sister, brother, um, you know, land children for the sake of the kingdom, like if that's what he's asking me for, you better believe I'm going to respond to it. Mm -hmm. And I can't even apologize for that. You know, and, and that's yeah, kind of like, when like, you're, right. you know, you're outgoing like me, uh, value friendships, hot blooded, you know, I think that that was one of the biggest struggles in my faith was losing those around me or just being accosted by them mm -hmm. for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, and you know, Jacksonville, it's like everybody's asked, everybody identifies you with which church you go to because it's just a Bible belt, small town. Or what kind like, of lowered back end truck you're driving. Yeah, not even that. Not <laughs> That's Palaka, baby. The Palaka, That's Palaka right there, baby. <laughs> oh, but, you know, I mean, it's the same thing. You know, you, you kind of go through that stuff. And then families, it's even worse, you know, because these are people that you love and that you love unconditionally. You think that you do. And um, and you're not you're not given that same respect. Yeah. And it hurts, you it know, does, but yeah. but at the same time, God gives us a lot of comforting words, you Amen. know, you know, and those are all examples of kind of really close interpersonal relationships. But it drives me crazy when I see this on a larger scale, when you see <clears throat> bishops trying <clears throat> to just get the adulation of culture and you see Christians just kind of capitulating to society. It's not going to work. They're never going to love you. They're never going to love you the way that Christ can. And you, you see these bishops like, you know, kind of being cool with politicians, being cool with celebrities, making things lax. Look, man, the church is supposed to be set apart. And the more we try to get integrated in society and accepted by it, the more watered down we become and the less effective. Look, we, Christ said they're going to hate you for my name. Trying to get society and culture in general to love the church is a fool's errand. We need to be yeah a sign of contradiction. We need to be an alternative to this empty life that the modern world provides. And we need to remember, it's not about, Jesus didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring a sword and divide, cut things in half. And the church needs to be cut in half away from the world and be something more than the world can offer. Otherwise, yeah. the world, the church is just a watered down, also ran in culture and yeah. won't keep up. I mean, we follow, we could, follow could, literally. Could, guys, could, I'm sorry, could, I need to plug in my, my computer's about to die real quick. Yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, plug on. it in, plug it <laughs> in. Six and a half hours later. Well, thanks so much for letting me plug back in and shock my computer back to life. And I hope that you were shocked that that happened. Um, so, you know, Sheila, I got to tell you, this is exactly, exactly what the sword means it's like jesus came as the divine physician surgically delineating for us the distinction between good and evil there has to be separation without that type of definitive moral compass we're just going to be in that relativistic world that it's like okay whatever is is good to me no there's objective evil there is objective good and we need an institution, and thank God that that institution is based on the authority of Jesus Christ, because he is the one who expresses what is truly good and what is truly bad. And I think this is a great segue to the next shocking thing Jesus expresses. Right. And here's the thing that, like you said, there has to be some division. And a lot of times our bishops or our, our people who should be leading the church are so afraid to call people out because they might lose some social standing or some tax benefit, or they might get persecuted. But Jesus did not pull any punches. In fact, Jesus was a name caller. Jesus called people some pretty interesting names and was not afraid to call the powers that be out for their shenanigans. So if you look at more or less all of Matthew 23, which is a warning against hypocrisy, I mean, Jesus is unloading on the Pharisees and the scribes and the people who sit on the teach who sit on the seat of Moses. He's laying into them. I mean, he's calling them in Matthew 23, 15, a child of hell. In um, Matthew 23, 17, he's calling them fools. 
um, in Matthew 23, 27, he calls them whited sepulchers, which is great because out, you know, a sepulcher is a tomb outside. It's all white and beautiful, but, but inside it's full of decay and bones. Um, in Matthew 23, 33, he calls them snakes and a brood of vipers. I mean, could you imagine the outrage if a bishop called Biden a viper today? They'd be like, oh my gosh, this bishop's out of control and you get banned from Twitter, right? And well, we, we need to have a more constructive dialogue. Jesus didn't pull that. You know, Jesus straight up called people out. But the sake of it was not just name calling, like, you know, when we're hanging out and we're calling each other all kinds of things, right? It's not just kind of crass name calling or the kind that Jesus warned against where he's like, don't call your brother a blockhead, a raka, right? This is intentionally designed to, call, to create conversion in people, not just to be contentious. But Jesus was not afraid to call people names and call people out for their you know, their business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think he really hates like the abuse of power in the church. I mean, it was very, 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 very clear that to whom much is given, much is expected. And I think the reason why is because you lead so many people, you can lead so many people astray. And a lot of times they're just kind of caught up in their, their place of honor. Right. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, the, the destructiveness of that is, you know, I mean, these people need the Lord, right. For healing the innocent, the sick, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, a lot of his anger is directed, I believe towards the, the people in, in the church, you know, and And, and, and especially if leadership is, is leading you to hell, like, is there a hell? Is there heaven? Is there hell? You know, and and in the separation of the direction of one's life, if if the direction of my life is going to hell, I want to know about that. Yeah. You know, like personally, like I, I hope that I would have somebody in my life that would confront me in my behavior and say, you know, Rich, like, you know, your behavior is leading you to hell. Yeah. You know, this is a temporary thing that we're in in life. And, you know, I need guidance and I need that guidance to come outside of myself and outside of my limited intellect, you know, so the importance and I I think what you're what you're sharing Delacrosse is so astute to the whole to the whole sense of of what leadership calls you to like that responsibility is great. And and Jesus is willing to lead even to the point of death. Yeah, you know, to be mm-hmm. able to profess this truth and to profess this, That's right. you know, and and it's and it's not name calling for name call's sake. You know, it's not it's not joking. It's not. It's at the same time, it's not. Um, you know, just trying to attack someone's dignity either. It, what she's saying, it's like you know, Jesus is saying this pointedly, and 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 he's saying it in deference to the poverty of the people, and the and the their greatest poverty is that they have poor leadership. And, mm-hmm. and thank God for Jesus Christ and his word and thank God for the church because the church needs leaders like bishops, like cardinals, like popes who have efforts of diplomacy and how they administer within diplomacy is paramount, you know, because, because these words need to be directed with charity speaking to the very nature of what is being done in leadership yep. or what is not being done. You, you know, the analogy of the good physician earlier. You know, no one wants to hear you have cancer when you go to the doctor. You don't want to hear it. No one wants to hear your blood pressure is high or whatever the doctor tells you. You hear it and it's not something you want to be told. But it's for your own benefit to know that, to have someone with authority, to have someone with expertise in this case, tell you and diagnose what's wrong with you. And so often in our culture, we're so afraid of offending people and calling people out because it's like, oh, judge not. We, you know, we, we're not judging people. And that's n- Look, what a judge does is gives a punishment. What a jury does is decides who's guilty, right? It's very easy for people to say, look, how you're living is wrong. Now, I can't send you to hell, but I can certainly tell you what you're doing is wrong because I have discernment. So the whole judge not lest you be judged and judge, you know, look, judge by the same measure you want to be judged by. Look, if I'm doing things that I'm calling people out for the same, then I'm a hypocrite. But if I'm calling people out for things that they're doing that I'm not doing and I have the spiritual maturity to call them out, I'm, I'm helping them. I'm doing an act of mercy. 
And so often our culture is so afraid to do that to anyone because you get canceled, you get shut down. Everyone's like, wow, you're judgmental. Too bad because narrow is the gate, right? And that's going into our next point is that number four of the shocking things Jesus says is that many people go to hell. Narrow is the gate, um, which is um, Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. And those who enter through it are many. How narrow the gate and constricted the road that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, everyone thinks everything's okay and do whatever you want and live how you want. And you do you and express yourself and find your own truth. That is a road to destruction. That is the wide, easy road to destruction. But, you know... Um, acquiescing to the teachings of Christ and being docile and being obedient to the teachings of the church. That's the narrow road. No one wants to hear that. Everyone wants everyone to go to heaven, but no one wants to consider that many, or if not most will go to hell right there, according to Christ himself. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm reminded of is our men's expedition trip and that little narrow path and that narrow road that, that like led by this huge, you know, drop and it was just such a it was such a scary part of of the journey but in order for you to get to the waterfall like you had to go through the narrow the narrow path and what's the what's the easy route like just stay at the bottom of the mountain you know like don't yeah. don't climb it but you know like the experience of fraternity and community was there on top of that that mountain i remember i spoke with a small family and four kids and, and these little four kids were like, you know, yeah, we we just like, you know, we were so afraid that we just crawled through that through that <laughs> narrow, that narrow pass. And and, you know, when you think about the path that God is calling us on, I, I love Fulton Sheen's expression of what the church is. And he said, if I were not Catholic. If I were not a Catholic and I were looking for the true church in the world today, I would look for the one church which did not get along well with the world. In other words, I would look for the church which the world hated. And and the fact that, you know, like the, the pressures of that, and yeah, we're looking at a cancel culture. If we express something in truth, you know, we could be canceled. Is that something we should be afraid of, you know? Well, I would, I would be more afraid of the fact of going to hell. I would be more yeah. afraid of the fact of like following the massive amount of people that are just moving in, in one direction toward what direction? I don't know. Is it toward unity? It, yeah. it, in, it, like, it doesn't seem that way, you know, because the unity that I experience going through narrow paths with people and suffering through it is a far superior solidarity and unity than anything that is is based in the flesh and laxity and sloth and and relativism like it, you know like there there's nothing there i lived in that world too you know i lived yeah. in that world too but i, I think most people uh, especially you know you talk about the expedition that we went on estovir expeditions we're doing more next year and and i can't tell you the fruit that came from it but i think most guys like that came on the trip and i think most people in general are good-willed people right um, you have a lot of evil people that or people that, uh, you know, work within the principalities of evil that confuse others, lie to others who aren't really solid in their faith. Then you have others who have faith, appreciate the faith, but are victimized by the culture that we live in. And and it's up to us to to bring them together, to allow them to experience God and it's and it's just purity and his purity for us, pure love. And, and, and that's what I think our church needs is like, just cut through all the confusion. Like church, the, the church is, is Christ's bride. Like he passionately loves us, like start there and then and work out. But like all this stuff that, I mean, I don't even turn on all this stuff. Cause I mean, even Facebook, the Catholics are just so freaking self aggrandizing. And it's just, I just find it so, distasteful. I just don't look at it anymore. But you know, all this stuff that's going out with the canceling and all that kind of stuff, it just makes people afraid. And there's a lot of good people that are afraid that need to realize that they're not afraid and just experience God's love because that's what he wants in his church. He wants to love you, you know, you know, so many um, 
everyone thinks they're a good person more or less, right? I mean, you know, there's a lot of people who are racked with guilt, but in general, people think they're good people because they judge themselves on their intentions. They say, well, of course, you know, if the little old lady was crossing the street, I'd help her. Of course, if there was a starving kid, I'd give them water. And they have this whole narrative in their head of who they are and what they would do. Mm. But when, when you get judged by what you actually do, yeah, holy moly, it's a complete difference, right? Yeah, I would help a lady across the street. That do I? Nothing. <laughs> do I? Yeah, I, th I think that I would, you know, if I saw someone getting, um, you know, oppressed or beaten, I would help them. Do you? You know, yeah, I think that I would give food and water to a poor kid. Of well, that's, the, that's the kind lie. of person I am. Do that's you? That's the big lie of virtue signaling. Virtue signaling there is, you go. is you you preach this wrong and this mean, so let's take this person out. And none of these people are actually doing any of this crap. They're not love. They're just loving their own, right? And and they're staying in their own little bubble. And none of them have any shred of courage to speak out against things that are just objectively wrong in the world. You know, it's crazy. We we've got such a child trafficking problem in the world, and people are pointing out that somebody tweeted something like twenty years ago or whatever. And you're just like, what are you? Like this is the your your purpose in your life right now it really needs some examination. If you if this is what you're focused on, when there's so many people suffering in the world, way beyond this, you know, it just drives people. Me crazy. People are just so desperate for community and belonging. People are yeah. so desperate to belong to a a pack of people because they get a sense of protection, you know. And and yeah, it, that's what we see in virtue signaling it's like oh i can align with this movement and now i'm a part of this movement and now i'm, I'm, I'm protected yeah i'm accepted i'm i'm protected whether you believe everything or not it's yeah. like you'll you'll you could profess that i could hit all of those vocal points and yeah. and wear whatever i need to wear clothing wise or look a particular way so that i could fit into that like like no like the courageous human person set free you know, to do what is objectively right within the capacity of natural law, like discern what that is and pursue it wholeheartedly and be willing to die for it. And when you actually take that step, you step in the direction of the martyrs and saints that have gone before you. You step in the direction of Jesus Christ, who is the true leader among men, who says, I will lead you to eternal life. And he's the one who's pointing out like, like, look, there is a great massive amount of people who are doing these type of alignable moves to fit in and belong. Well, where is that leading? It's leading to destruction. Well, it's, it's Satan, leading to destruction. Look, Satan, Satan's not stupid. And he's not going to make the road to hell look difficult because no one would take it. The road to hell looks very nice, wide, nice, easy road, no obstacles. Just, you know, it's all cruising, man. 65, don't have to worry about a thing until you hit the wall at the end of it. The road to the road to heaven is narrow. It's difficult. It's challenging. And, you know, it calls to mind for me what Pope St. John Paul II said is that true freedom is not the ability to do what you want. It's the freedom to do what you ought. And that is such a unique thought in today's world is that freedom, everyone thinks freedom is like, look, I'm going to, I'm, I can be whatever I want. I can change my my gender on, on a whim. I can change my morals, my values. I can change my family. I can change my hair color, my eye color, you know, implants, plastic surgery. I can be whatever I want. I, that's true freedom, but that's not freedom. That's just a golden cage, man. That's not really setting you free. True freedom is the ability to do what you should, what is aligned with natural oh, law God. and with divine command. Right. That's true freedom. That's, Nothing else will ever satisfy these people. It's an interior. It's an interior disposition. Freedom is an interior right. disposition, not not an exterior function. Right. And I I see it most in like I see the natural Ryan and I see the the supernatural Ryan as close as I am to Christ in the Eucharist. Sunday really gives me that rest in the Lord. I receive communion. And I do things that I am like, I'm like, wow, you know, like I'm extra patient with my children. I'm, you know, I'm concerned about somebody. I give them a call. Like, that's not me. Like, that's not me. That's God living in me and be inspiring me to do certain things. Like the, these things don't happen. You know, you know what, do you know what else is free, Ryan? What? Do you know what else is free? 
the number one app on the app store for Catholics, which is Hollow. Hollow, if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can get the number one Catholic app for free. Now, why don't you guys tell them a little bit about what Hollow can do? (laughs) In the words of Ray Charles' mother in that great movie, maybe ain't nothing in this world free but Jesus. (laughs) But Hollow is right there next to it. Now, Hollow is a fantastic (laughs) Catholic (laughs) app. And, and the Catholic, you know, they come from the heritage of Catholic prayer and meditation and, you know, the Bible in a year with Father Mike Schmitz, their app continues to grow each and every week with new content, new material to help you, you know, really take a moment and retreat from the world and enter more deeply into the inner call of that inner freedom of responding to Christ's call for you. And the Hallow is the number one app for a reason. And if you haven't checked it out yet, don't miss another moment. Check out Hallow today. Now, our other sponsor is Catholic Monthly. Now, every month, what Catholic Monthly is is a monthly subscription box that gives you sacramentals, books, all different kinds of curated things to help you grow in your faith every month. Now, comes in a nice little box, right? Nice cardboard box. But what this really is, is a treasure chest because you're tapping into the treasury of the history and the devotions of the church. So I don't even know what this one is. This one came. Let's see what we got in here. We got, oh, that's really nice, actually. This beautiful Sacred Heart journal and notebook. That's pretty cool. What is that, leather? What is that, velvet? We We got a prayer card to the Sacred Heart. So this is for the month of June, right? So we have a prayer card to the Sacred Heart. Now, when you go, well, we got a bunch of this stuff. Ooh, nice. Wow. Let's, let's see what yeah. else we got. I'm excited. Oh, a little. Huh. Hello, what is this? Ah. Beautiful. Really of the Sacred Heart. Nice. Right? That's awesome. So these are the kinds of things that you're getting every month. Oh, and then prayers, right? on how to use, you know, and how to pray this. Okay. Let's see one, oh, one more, th- oh, wow. This thing is packed full. <laughs> we got a Ooh, sacred a heart chrism candle. candle. Yeah, it's a chrism scented candle made of beeswax. That's Ooh. amazing. And then this. What's in the bag? What's in What's the bag? bag? What you got in that bag? <laughs> Let's see. Oh, wow. Oh, those are cool. That's cool. What is it? That's so fitting. So this is for the month of June, the month of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Heart. Yeah. That's beautiful. Oh, but it's a locket. Oh, wow. What's a locket? So, so you put a picture or something special inside of it. You wear that it. around your neck. Wow, I thought it looks like Flavor Flav. Flav. Yeah, that's Flav. the Catholic version of Flavor Flav. Hey. So, so this is what you get with Catholic Monthly. I got a journal. I got a chrism scented beeswax candle, a Sacred Heart a locket, a Sacred Heart Holy Medal, and a Sacred Heart Prayer Card, as well as instructions and prayer guides and different prayers. That's what you get every month with Catholic Month with Catholic Monthly. Um, but each month is curated around a theme. So if you go to catholicmonth.ly, you can get your first month, not free, but 50% off. You can cancel at any time. It really is an amazing thing, and these things are awesome. I look forward to getting them every month. Because every month, I mean, they're so full of these really amazing devotional items, sacramentals, things that we can really use to focus on a particular devotion for that month. So, again, go to catholicmonth.ly. Now, let's get into our last thing that's shocking that Jesus said. Now, we talked a lot about people sinning, talking about division, talking about hating your mom and dad, um, all this, right? But I think one that's very shocking to today's world is that when um, when there's the woman com- accused of adultery and everyone was going to stone her, and then he said, you know, he who is out, he who is without sin can throw the first stone, and then no one was left, right? So this is coming from John eight eleven. Then Jesus straightened up and said to her, "Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you?" She replied, "No one, sir." Which I always thought it was weird that she calls Jesus sir, but okay. Then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now, most people stop right there. Jesus doesn't condemn the sinner, but you have to read on. Go from now on and sin no more. That's the part right there that people don't want to 
acknowledge. They say, Jesus didn't condemn the woman, but there is also the mandate and the command to sin no more. The forgiveness and the lack of condemnation by Jesus goes hand in hand with the call to sin no more. You cannot have the two separate. That's the call to sin no more and the desire to sin no more is what gets you the forgiveness in the first place. So what do you think about that, guys? So, you know, like, again, this this is very helpful to look at the larger context, right? So it's important to open up and dig as deep as you possibly can. So this is coming in the in the context of there's division among the people and then the authorities of that present day, Jesus confronting the authorities because these authorities have caught this woman in the act of adultery. And then we see Jesus's action of intervention and mercy for a particular reason for conversion of heart. So the fact that this woman who is caught in the trajectory of sin, again, think of confrontation in the sense of what I was saying before. If I'm on a, if I'm on a path to hell and my, my life is more and more so eroding and becoming more destructive of everything around me and then within myself, I do hope that somebody is there to intervene on my behalf. Jesus does so sensitively. And I love, I love this gospel passage the most because it's the way that he delivers that blow to these authorities who are exercising that they are God on earth. Like Jesus is like, you're not God. You know, let those who are without sin cast the first stone. So Jesus is showing the supreme authority of God. And what is that supreme authority based in? Righteousness and mercy. It's like the fact that God looks with mercy upon us and wants to say, look, I don't condemn you for what you've done because that's not who you are. Who you are is mine. Return to me and sin no more. And, and you know, seeing that aspect of Jesus's delivery shows, shows more of, 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 you know, a revelation of God that, that we could spend a lifetime meditating on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, The, the whole concept of, I, I mentioned this earlier is that, you know, everyone could see her guilt. She was caught in the act, right? They were able to say she's guilty, but they, the, the judge sentences you and Jesus is the great and terrible judge. God is the judge, not the people. So certainly you can say someone's guilty. You can call out people for things that they're doing wrong. The judgment and the punishment ultimately comes from God, but go and sin no more. That's people always forget the second half, that corollary, right? Just doing whatever you want. Jesus, look, tolerance is not a Christian virtue. You, you tolerance have, of sin is not a virtue. Forgiveness you is a virtue. You wouldn't have contrition, though. You wouldn't have contrition if, of course you, not. if you didn't want to go and sin no more. I mean, I, I think if, if you're one of those people who, like, uses God's mercy, um, you're not, you're not, I mean, confession is not going to matter to you, right? I mean, it's, it, it, it should, it shouldn't matter because you really just, you know, you don't care about sinning no more. You just care. You have some weird relationship with God and, and his mercy and a lack of understanding there. You know, the other thing too, is like, is like in the, our father, a lot of people get this stuff mixed up too, because everybody's just full of resentment and anger towards other people. It's like, God, it says, forgive others as, or I, uh, forgive me as you forgive others, right? Is that way? Father, Lord, in heaven, can you come be done on earth them? Give us the, the, the bread. Forgive us our trespasses <laughs> as we forgive others who trespass against us. That's what That's I wanted it. to say. But it's, it's do you just have to say the alphabet to the ABCD of the But I think the point I'm making is that you know, for, forgive us as we, for, as we forgive others. Like we have to forgive other people. If you're going and you're expecting God's mercy and you walk out of that confessional and you're like, she's a little, mm, mm, mm. you know what I mean? It's like, no, man, if you're, <laughs> no, you, man. No, Come but you on, can't man. Do She's a little. Mm, mm, mm. <laughs> that girl, you know that girl. I seen her over at your grandma's house. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> but you're right. You know, look, it really again, sinning no more and getting not condemned. They go in hand in hand, right? It's a mercy yeah. of the judge letting you off with leniency. Yeah, 
but you know, the leniency comes with the commitment to not sin again. So, I mean, in today's world, it's, Hey, you're not condemned. But the shocking part is sin no more because everyone wants to do whatever they want and not be condemned. Well, Hey, take the speck out of your eye, take the plank out of your eye. Jesus said, not judge. I didn't condemn you. Everyone wants to remember the first half of these, never the second half so that you could judge more clearly so that you sin no more, right? The second half is always the shocking part and no one, everyone quits after the easy part that gives them license to do whatever the heck they want. So those are five shocking things that Jesus said. Now, if we missed any, make sure you put them in the comments uh, here on YouTube or on any of the places that you see this post. Um, but Jesus is a, Jesus can be a shocking at times. I mean, shocking. Look, if God became man, isn't something that is completely compelling, different, set apart, and world shattering dynamite? Probably not God. Jesus is shocking. Jesus is dynamite. Jesus, Jesus blows up the conventions of the world and calls us to come back to him. And that's why considering the shocking things that he said in, in scripture should be a call to go read more about it. It's so true. It's like, you know, if that, if that happened 2000 years ago, it's still happening today. Like, you know, and it will continue to happen until the end of time. And if, if you have the testimony, you know, and, and of, of so many people over the past 2000 years, men, women, and children who've come to encounter the person of Jesus Christ and say that you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God in the words of Peter, like for each of us, you know, look, all of us come from a very colorful background. All of us have sinned. All of us have turned from ways that we were living. And it's not that we are perfect now. No, we're continuing the turn. We're continuing to turn back to Christ. And he's motivating us to continue to move toward that narrow gate. And we want you to be a part of that movement. You know, the Catholic Church wants you to be a part of that movement. And it's all about being open to the teachings of Christ and prioritizing those teachings and that news more so than any other types of influencers. Why would you spend time with other influencers or politicians and get all fired up and, and excitable about athletics and sports and ESPN and all these other types of things that, that are really just pulling your freedom in and your time? You know, like when you look at what Christ can do for you is the most important thing. He neither condemns you, he wants you to be set free. Like St. John Paul II expressed, he says, Christ set us free for freedom's sake. And that is love, and that is free. And, and that is what's beautiful about our show, because we continue to talk about our Savior, Jesus Christ, and it's great to develop a solidarity and friendship with you. If you do have some of those more shocking things that are personal to you, make sure you hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, on Twitter, as well as in the commentary section below on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe, click the bell, and spread the good news. We'll check you next week. God bless.